contrary to popular belief, there are seven quad muscles, not four, and not only can they be selectively trained, such as targeting the BMO to build that teardrop inner quad shape, or the vastus lateralis to build the outer quads, but even the quad muscles themselves don't grow evenly. Like all muscles, they undergo regional hypertrophy, which science also calls inhomogeneous or non-uniform hypertrophy, and for the quads, it means that they have upper, middle, and lower regions that all grow at different rates, in both size and strength. And if you're thinking these must be small differences, think again. We're talking three to five times as much growth in one part of a muscle versus another from the same exact exercise. So if you thought the quads were just four muscles that all do the same thing and grow at the same rate, this will be the most important quad video you ever watch. Because I'm going to show you exactly how you can apply dozens of different regional training factors and proven techniques in order to target and fill out any specific quad muscle or region you want. And if you like what you see, please let me know by hitting that like button, commenting below on what muscles you'd most like me to go over next, and be sure to subscribe and turn on new video notifications so that you don't miss those videos when I do them. Let's get to it. The medial or inner quads are made up by the vastus medialis muscles, and that's plural because there are two, the vastus medialis longus or VML and obliquus or VMO, and they are actually separate muscles with very different roles and structures, so you need to train them differently. First, let's go over how to hit the VMO, the all-important muscle that creates that awesome teardrop shape just inside and above the knee. And guys, of the entire quads, the VMO will be the single most important region for you to focus on. And not just because it looks the best, although it does when properly developed, but more importantly, a weak VMO is the leading cause of anterior knee pain and injury, such as patellofemoral syndrome, especially among weightlifters. In fact, statistically, the smaller your VMO is compared to your vastus lateralis, the more knee pain you're going to have. And the lateralis is naturally much bigger and stronger. So you have to preferentially target the VMO to avoid that imbalance, incorporating all five movements that the VMO performs. And here are 16 proven techniques you can use to do just that. Number one, the VMO is activated during the last 15 degrees of knee extension. So one way to target it is via what are called short arc quad exercises like this with your knee propped up. Or you can just do the last 15 degrees on a leg extension machine. Second, the VMO is type 2, fast twitch fiber dominant, so you'll want to use relatively quick contractions. Third, unlike most muscles, it grows best with concentric contractions. So really focus on the concentric phase where you're straightening your knee and really squeeze at the top to emphasize the point of max contraction. Also, because the VMO is on inside of the knee, if you externally rotate your leg while doing these, you'll position the VMO on top, directly opposite the resistance, which increases VMO activation. The next technique is to physically touch the VMO while you're working it, which sounds weird, but is something you can do to enhance selective activation of any muscle. Science calls this tactile stimulation, and it'll increase blood flow to the area. But more importantly, you'll activate something called a proprioceptive feedback loop to increase your mind's awareness of that specific area, aka mind-muscle connection. Now, if you're a little skeptical about this, know that many studies have proven it can significantly increase regional activation and growth. Some practitioners apply KT tape to the VMO during exercise to achieve the same proprioceptive feedback. I'll do a whole separate video on the mind-muscle connection and how to improve it in the future. But for now, if you can reach it, lightly press on your VMO when you're training. Next, studies have actually shown that closed kinetic chain exercises work the VMO more than open kinetic chain exercises do, but again, only during the last 15 degrees of knee extension. If you're not familiar with what closed versus open kinetic chain movements are, just replay this screen or pause it until you're comfortable with it. So a closed chain version of the short arc quad exercise could be a weighted step up that's only a few inches off the ground, while still emphasizing quick concentric contractions. Or an even better option is the reverse sled drag, because it exclusively works the concentric phase of knee extensions, which the VMO prefers. You can also do these on a cable machine, although with that you'll work both concentric and eccentric contractions. Or if you don't have any equipment, a bodyweight closed kinetic chain option would be the sissy squat, except only dropping down about 15 degrees to target the VMO. Interestingly, studies show that doing any of these exercises with your ankle dorsiflexed, aka foot angled upwards, increases VMO specific activation even more. But how is that possible? The quads aren't anywhere near the ankle. It's because of something called fascia that connects the ankle dorsiflexors to the VMO. Fascia is a connective tissue that covers muscles, and recent research is discovering that it has a far greater impact on muscular activation than people thought. 
and I'll also be covering that in more detail in a future video. Now, all these final 15 exercises are great. However, unlike most of the quads, the VMO doesn't originate from the femur. Instead, it originates directly from the adductor magnus, the primary hip adductor muscle, and then inserts on the inside of the knee and via fascia directly to the inside of the tibia or shin bone. And its fibers are mostly oriented horizontally or inwards. So to work it even better, you combine final 15 knee extension with hip adduction. An excellent way to do that, that studies have proven nails the BMO, is to grab a stability ball or any decent sized ball and squeeze it between your knees as hard as you can while simultaneously doing shallow partial range of motion squats. If you don't have a ball, another option is a shallow sumo deadlift or squat where your feet are set wide apart, which places more resistance against adduction. Or for a bigger challenge, you can get into a sumo squat position and then move from side to side alternately extending each knee. And by the way, you'll notice with some of these demos, I'm not using much weight, but that's just because I'm currently rehabbing from a torn meniscus. So you should normally load these like you would any other leg workout. Next is a technique I developed specifically to maximize BMO selective activation. You'll strap your ankle to a knee high cable or resistance band that's set to the side and behind you, starting with your knee bent around 15 degrees. Then you'll move your leg at an angle in and forward while straightening your knee. This simple technique engages all three primary VMO movements simultaneously. Hip adduction, knee extension with external rotation within that final 15 range, and most importantly, due to what I call the lever and fulcrum principle, which I explained in a previous YouTube video I'll link below, having the resistance pull out from all the way down on your ankle forces the VMO to work hard to provide medial knee tilt stabilization, which is by far its primary role but one that all the other VMO exercises are largely missing. Just don't use too much weight because you don't want to overwhelm the VMO's stabilizing capability, but strengthen it, which makes this a great use case for BFR cuffs because you can get all the heavyweight gains without actually using heavy weight. Do this right, and I promise you'll feel it right in the VMO like you never have before. Now, due to its unique position to the side of the knee, if the knee is mostly straight, activating the VMO will fully straighten it. However, if the knee is mostly bent, activating the BMO will actually fully flex it, which very few people know. But if you'll forgive me saying so, I've developed the perfect technique to hit it that way. It's this very specific leg curl variation, because for one, it places the 90 degree point of max resistance right at full knee flexion. But more importantly, when your hips, knee, and ankle are all flexed like this, it puts your calf and hamstring muscles into active insufficiency. So they can't dominate the knee flexion like they would on a leg curl machine, leaving all the load for the VMO. And notice I'm also simultaneously internally rotating my lower leg. That's because the lower VMO fibers also perform tibial internal rotation. So adding that will recruit it even more. Now I know this is a little counterintuitive for a quad muscle, but if you have doubts, just try this exactly the way I'm doing it, really squeezing out that max flexion, and you will feel it right in your VMO. Now, you'll notice I said the lower VMO fibers perform this internal rotation, which brings us to regional hypertrophy of the VMO. Despite its shorter length, it's divided into upper and lower regions. Now, those are actually further divided into superficial and deep sections, but we won't go there the lower VMO's fibers insert lower down on the tibia and are essentially completely horizontal. So they're pulling in, which means, as we touched on, exercises that work medial tilt, hip adduction, internal tibial rotation, or max knee flexion will engage the lower region the most, while the upper VMO fibers are higher up and a little more vertical, so they're pulling more upwards, which means all the final 15 knee extension exercises we went over will engage the upper region the most. Now let's hit the VML, which makes up the bulk of the inner quads. It originates from the inside of the femur and then inserts on the inside of the patella and directly to the medial side of the tibia through fascia. So when it contracts, it pulls up on the knee with a medial or internal bias. In fact, studies show that it pulls in first and then up. So similar to the VMO, one way to selectively target the VML is to perform knee extensions while externally rotating your hip and lower leg, creating a medial angle to the resistance. But that's about where the similarities end between the two. Unlike the VMO, the VML is activated most during the eccentric or negative phase of contractions, even when your leg is straight. So to really nail the VMO, overload the eccentric phase by doing the initial extension with both legs, then resist the negative phase with just one. 
and you can use up to 120% of that leg's one rep max. Also, unlike the VMO, the VML is type one slow twitch fiber dominant. So you'll want to go relatively slow. In fact, it grows best if you take at least four seconds to get from the top to the bottom. The VML is also maximally activated at between 70 to 90 degrees of knee flexion. So you should also integrate partial range of motion knee extensions, but unlike the VMO, this time you'll stick to the bottom more flexed range. And that also applies to compound quad exercises because deep partial range of motion squats between 70 and 90 degrees of knee flexion also preferentially target the VML. And adding external hip rotation to these by flaring your knees out more than usual will increase VML activation even more. And once again, in general, closed kinetic chain exercises like the sissy squat preferentially activate the inner quad muscles more, except with the VML, you'll want to stay low. Finally, as an interesting side note, recent research discovered that the VML is also physically connected to the tensor fascia lata muscle, again via fascia, so exercises that target the fascia lata, like this one, also activate the VML, even though that's essentially the opposite of what the VML itself does. Now let's hit regional training within the VML, or how to preferentially build its upper, middle, and lower regions. First off, in general, the things we went over that target the VMO will also generally load the lower VML region, which makes sense because the VMO pretty much sits on top of the lower VML. Next is knee angle. Doing knee extensions at longer, more extended muscle fiber lengths works the lower VML region significantly more than the upper two, while working it at shorter muscle fiber lengths works the upper region more. And this is a regional hypertrophy pattern that has been shown for dozens of other muscles, such as the biceps, where working them at longer muscle lengths loads the distal region the most, while shorter muscle lengths targets the proximal region. This also means that if you do leg extensions with a weight stack instead of a flywheel machine, you'll be working the upper region of the VML more, because a weight stack creates variable resistance that's close to zero at the bottom and highest at the top, where the fiber lengths are shortest. Next, eccentric contractions preferentially build the lower VML region, while concentric contractions generate more even activation across all regions. Next, compound movements like the back squat tend to preferentially work the upper regions of all quad muscles, while isolation exercises like leg extensions preferentially work the lower regions. However, that's also affected by contraction speed and how relatively heavy the load is. Fast contractions and lighter weight both engage the lower VML more, while slower contractions with heavier weight both engage the upper two VML regions more. Interestingly, the complete opposite is true for the vastus lateralis, which we'll cover in part two, that's likely because of the huge difference in muscle fiber type between the two muscles. Next, wearing BFR cuffs with any exercise significantly boosts hypertrophy of all quad regions, but tends to increase upper and middle region growth more than the lower region. Next, the equipment you use also affects regional hypertrophy. For example, while a heavy barbell squat will work the upper VML region the most, using a Smith machine with the same squat only significantly works the middle region, and even then only in the vastus lateralis. So you're shifting the primary load off the VML entirely. And we've already discussed the difference that using a flywheel versus weight stack leg extension machine makes. Even the set patterns you use affect regional growth. For example, using a drop set pattern significantly increases upper region growth of all the quads more than a traditional set pattern does, with the greatest effect on the rectus femoris, which we'll go over in part three. Why drop sets? Nobody knows. Which just goes to show how complex regionality is and how much more there still is to learn. Last is a technique you can use to enhance growth of any muscle region you want, and that's through regional myofascial release. Doing myofascial release via a foam roller or muscle gun is one of the best ways to warm up pre-workout because it activates the muscle without inhibiting strength or increasing the risk of injury like stretching right before a workout does. But here's the secret. Doing one to two minutes of myofascial release on a muscle region right before a workout has also been proven to increase swelling of that region during that workout. And it's been well documented that increased swelling during and after a workout ultimately leads to greater gains in that region. The takeaway? I don't know if anyone else has made this connection yet, and I couldn't find any studies directly testing it, but I believe this means you can use pre-workout myofascial release to further enhance region-specific hypertrophy by rolling or gunning that region right before you work it. Now, that's a lot to remember, with many different factors at play. And remember, we've only gone over the inner quads so far, and I didn't even cover everything I have on that. So I'll be going over many more essential regional techniques and principles in part two and three of this quad series. So because region-specific training of the quads is so complex and there's so many factors to keep track of, I've created a whole new section of my all-access basic membership platform 
dedicated to regional training. And there I've published all the actionable items and techniques for targeting the inner quad muscle regions, along with the regional techniques for the other muscles I've gone over in this series so far, the calves and lats, and will eventually have regional training instructions for every muscle in the body on there, so that you can know exactly how to fill out any problem area you may have. This will be the single most comprehensive resource for region-specific training in existence. But even that is just a small fraction of all the top tier fitness content that the All Access Basic Membership gives you access to, all for less than 10 measly bucks a month. However, if you're a little boggled by all this different regional training info and would rather have somebody just take all of it and integrate it into a program for you, all of this regional quad training is fully integrated and optimized, along with regional training of all the other leg muscles, in the Hypertrophy Series Total Leg Program, which was just released after more than a year in development. And you can find more details about it via a link in the video description. Finally, for more free top-tier health and fitness content, make sure to join Fitness Tip Friday, an extremely popular weekly email newsletter that is always short, significant, and science-based, and also includes inspirational quotes, special deals, and updates. Once again, if you liked this video, please let me know by hitting that like button, commenting below on what muscles you'd most like me to go over after the quads, and be sure you're subscribed and have hit that bell icon so that you can be notified when those and all my other videos have been released. Mahalo, my friends. Until next time.